different kind of graph. All right, welcome back. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Imed Zituni. Um, I've known Imed for, I think, the past 25 years or so. Uh, we were both, uh, we both did our PhD uh, with uh, Jean-Paul and Jean-Paul's team a uh, long time ago in France, and we both moved to the US uh, where we were at um, uh, Bell Labs for a couple of years. And then after that, we both moved to um, IBM Research, where again, we both spent a couple of years then there. And at that point, we decided that we didn't have to follow each other anymore, and uh, Imed went to Microsoft, where he's now a principal research manager of the conversational understanding science team. Uh, Imed is leading the team working on uh, dialogue and understanding for uh, Microsoft Digital Assistant. Uh, he is um, a senior member of IEEE, he is a former uh, member of um, IEEE Speech and Language Technical Committee. Um, he is he's, uh, an associate editor of IEEE Transaction and Speech and Audio Processing and also associate editor of uh, ACM Transaction on Asian Languages and Low Resource uh, uh, Languages for Information Processing. And uh, today he's going to be talking about uh, conversational semantic search. Uh, please join me in welcoming Imed. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, I am really happy and glad being here. Thank you, Kamer, for the invite. It is really a pleasure to see friends and colleagues, and to see Jean-Paul, to see Kamer. Uh, both of them were my supervisor almost 20 years ago. <laughs> time, time flies. Uh, yes, uh, uh, time flies. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, conversation semantic search. Uh, I'll try to make the talk a little bit different. I'll start with a very high level and try to deep dive into the technology we have at Microsoft. Uh, before starting really the talk, I'd like to present a little bit the team. Uh, so this team is the science team responsible for natural language understanding and dialogue systems for Microsoft. Uh, when we say dialogue, uh, it comes to mind conversation agent, that is Cortana in the case of Microsoft. Uh, one of the recent achievement, and we delivered this a month ago, which is the speaker for uh, Microsoft. 
that I am showing here. Uh, that's our response to Alexa, Google Home. Uh, and this team played a big role there, enabling all the skills, building all the language understanding model, as well as providing dialogue capabilities for that. Uh, so what is the team's value? We are driven by AI size. Uh, we are focusing on production. Uh, Cortana, one of them. We provide also technology for the search engine Bing. We also work very closely with Office, and I will show in a little bit how we don't see digital assistance only in search and in dialogue. We see digital assistance everywhere. We see digital assistant in the spreadsheets. We see digital assistants in document. We see digital assistants uh, in uh, Word, uh, all of that. And I will get to that in two minutes. And the way we are evaluated from our VPs and from the community in general is through metrics. Uh, we look to metrics in a different way. We, I know usually in the research community, we focus on F measure, precision, recall, blue, rouge, those kind of metrics. We are looking to a different kind of metrics, and I'll try to address that here. We look to metrics that matters for the users. Our metric is if the user is happy or not. And I will get into that in a minute. And what does that mean, user is happy? And how we detect if the user is happy? and how uh, we can convince our managers to fund us because our user is uh, happier over time. <laughs> so uh, we are interested. Uh, I personally, my background is on speech, language modeling, and dialogue, but the team in general is focusing on different areas. Those are the conferences that we go to and we publish and we contribute to. Uh, so in addition to enter speech and ACASP and all that, ACL, we are interested in conferences like Wisdom, CIGAR, dub, dub, dub. Uh, and we get inspired by the work happening on this area and try to apply that to uh, speech, dialogue, and NLP. Now, going back to the talk, uh, I will try to divide the talk in three parts. Uh, and really, I start at a high level and try to deep dive uh, one step at a time. So I will st start talking about intelligence, about the skills, where we are today and where we are heading. Uh, I will then deep dive a little bit and talk about dialogue management to how to offer skills, whether it is Cortana or Alexa uh, or other digital assistants, how people proceed to write skills, uh, to write digital assistant. Uh, and then I will address a specific point that is maybe different to the speech community, but it's really well established field in search and information retrieval, which is modeling and understanding user satisfaction and user behavior, and how that will help uh, speech recognition, how that will help uh, dialogue systems to improve in terms of quality. And I will uh, then provide a summary. Okay, so. Let's look to a few examples. Uh, I don't know really what is happening in, in Europe or, or here in North Africa, uh, but in the US at least, if this is an example from uh, uh, messengers in Facebook where there is two people talking and suddenly one of them is saying, hey, uh, I am, you know, uh, I, we, they are talking about movie and as you see in here, there is a suggestion saying, giving information about the movie that is happening in here. So we consider that as an intelligence. That is a kind of skills that even if the discussion is between human, there is a suggestion happening in Messenger saying that, do you want me to help you? I understand your conversation and I would like to contribute to it. I'll provide another example again in Messenger where here saying, you are ready to go? And then he said, yes, and suddenly there is a suggestion. Do you want to write? And can I help you to book a cab for that? Uh, here, another discussion where they are talking about location. They are saying, where are you? And suddenly, the intelligence and the system saying, do you want me to send your location? So there is an understanding, and based on that, there is a reaction. Here, as well, there is a discussion between two. And here, the system is suggesting to pay and, and, and to wire money to the uh, one of them. Here is a starting a spreadsheet. Uh, so all these 
are intelligence, or these are skills or dialogue system in some sense, but it's not really provided in a way that you are addressing the system directly. It is hidden within other applications. In this case, it is uh, messengers. Let's take to the case of uh, Google Map. When you show a direction from A to B, and suddenly there is a suggestion here happening for Uber telling you, uh, do you want to Uber, do you want to ride to that direction? And, this is the, and, and by the way, this is the cost, and this is the, the time it's going to take you. And the user didn't really ask for a Uber. The user was only asking for a direction from uh, using Google Map to, sh to see the direction from point A to point B. Another example of intelligence, and this is in a spreadsheet. Uh, here, an example where you are looking to the stock price, and you just put equal, and you call a function. This is one that is used uh, from Google, but Microsoft also have a similar solution to that, where you get the stock price live. Uh, and that's also a kind of intelligence. This is another example here where you, know, you have the two-day dates, the, the Microsoft uh, stock price here, but it can be other things. Uh, and that's also a kind of intelligence. Here, a different example of intelligence where you just highlight a text and then you get a description for it, looking to a knowledge graph, what is a representation of that text. And this is a feed as well, where based on results, you have many suggestions that can happen to that results. You can see here in this example, you are looking for a movie. Now you have the entity movie returned. You click on that entity, and here it goes. You have option to buy a ticket to that movie. You have an option to see if there is an event happening related to that. Uh, this is another example from Amazon Candle, where today, if you highlight a text and you have a search and representation about it in the uh, knowledge graph. What I'm trying to get to is that at least we don't believe, uh, this is the community in general, that intelligence or skills uh, is going to be a niche addition to how people use technology. We mostly believe that it will become the prime mediator. All these kinds of intelligence or all these kind of digital assistants uh, will really uh, it is similar, the way we see it is similar or, or equivalent to the impact to the mobile phone that uh, was introduced maybe 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, or other people will tell you similar to the internet, kind of. Uh, so the way we see it that every company and institute should be accessible through assistance or it will become invisible. Uh, so. There is a lot amount of intelligence, so that it, we consider that it's going to be utility. Utility in a sense that people need electricity. I don't think that people will live without electricity today. The same thing we see intelligence in the future. People will not live without intelligence. Intelligence, or people use the term skills, or people use the term botlets, uh, it means the same thing, at least for my presentation. This is a few examples of what we have today, but I see this uh, moving forward. There is many more applications. Uh, so Cortana has its Invoke release a uh, month ago. Uh, you see Google has one as well. Alexa, it has many varieties of their digital assistant. Uh, there is the headphones as well. There is the Google Eclipse. Uh, Apple is going to release one in a couple of months. Uh, so there is uh, many, many. Uh, digital assistant happening to the market in this format, but also there is other format that are using digital assistant as well. So anyway, what I'm trying to get to is really we believe that we are starting to use more and more intelligence, and it's, it's as we are just at the beginning uh, of a new era of how to use technology uh, and uh, digital assistant. Going to the second part of the talk, which is how to author these skills, how people today proceed to uh, write these kind of intelligence. Uh, so before going to details, I'll start at a very high level what is happening today in most of dialogue systems. 
Most of dialogue system today, you uh, they, they, there is several components. Uh, one of them, people start usually detecting if there is a speech activity or not, is there a voice or not. If there is a voice, there is a speech recognition that you, we run. After that, we run the language understanding, uh, which is mostly detecting the domain, the intent, the slots in the intent. You feed that to a dialogue manager uh, that will try, uh, uh, then I will get to that point uh, in a little bit. The dialogue manager also will provide the kind of state and that the language generation will use that to generate a text. And then you have a text to speech in the case of uh, a speaker. But in other canvases, let's say uh, a laptop as an example, one can say that just you, get, you need the LG language generation, you don't need to text to speech. For this to happen, it is important to know that you need a huge knowledge base. The knowledge base is a representation of the mode, uh, the, uh, the word somehow, uh, where you have uh, an understanding of the entities, the relationship between the entities, the actions that are available. Uh, so we do believe that the knowledge base or the knowledge graph is really key components for these applications to succeed. Double clicking on the DM part, the dialogue manager part. Uh, so before going there, what, what I'd like to say that this structure, uh, maybe a few people see it a little bit old because now with deep learning uh, is causing this architecture to be rethought again. Uh, I would like to make a point here where I will talk about this later, but in usually deep learning is very promising when they are used as components within these boxes. There is this new idea of having deep learning where you have speech as an input, you have speech as output, and everything gets collapsed in one box. That is working great for uh, chit chat kind of applications. Uh, Microsoft has an application in China called Chawai that is based on this technology. A lot of data as an input. Uh, you have the answer, but it's not about task completion. You are not really performing a task. What I mean by task here, a task completion is when you are ordering a pizza and getting a pizza home. It's about when you are ordering a cat and something is happening. That is different from sheet chat when you said, as today, you go to Cortana and said, who is your daddy? It's going to tell you technically it's Bill Gates. There is no action really happening. It's a, just a sheet chat between the digital assistant and all that. In that structure, Deep learning is proven to improve and to work. Uh, when it's task-based, we are still using the uh, traditional approaches where deep learning are playing uh, key roles at the individual components versus changing the entire architecture. So double-clicking a little bit on the dialogue manager component. Uh, as you all know, actually, there is two pieces in it. There is a piece that is about state tracking and then the action selection. Uh, what is the state tracking? So you need to update the state of the dialogue. Uh, as an example, uh, where are we? Are we still keep going on that task? Are we in the middle of the task we didn't complete it? Are you in the final state? Uh, is the task being canceled? Is the task being completed? Uh, and as well as what is missing? What is the entities that are missing that I need to collect to perform my task? If you are looking to a cab uh, or trying to, uh, to order Uber from destination A to destination B, and you have destination A, uh, you know that now you need to look to the destination B because that is missing. You know that you need to know as well the price or the type of the car that you are ordering because that's missing. And, and that is what I'm referring to here. Now for the action selection, other people refer to it as policy. And this is mostly how I should go back to the user and the request information. Uh, how, instead of asking the user to uh, give me more information, can I go somewhere else and fetch that information? without really doing disambiguation. If you ask for, as an example, going again to the example of uh, a ride from point A to point B, I can, by default, assume that since you want to ride, you are going to go from this place 
to a destination. So because of that, I can automatically detect the current position where you are without having to ask you. And this is where uh, a knowledge-based information is very important. Uh, if I tell you I'm going from uh, ESGR, ISGR to uh, Marrakech downtown, uh, I should be able to detect the name, understand that that entity refers to an institute. From the institute, I have a knowledge base to find its address. From the address, I can find the longitude and latitude and re re resolve all that automatically without going every time to the user and asking him, what about this, what about that? All that can be done and uh, using these action selection mechanisms. And of course, we need to store all this information and to keep the context. The context is very important on these tasks. Uh, we need to know your history. You need to know what you are doing. We need to know your preferences. All that will help make the uh, dialogue and the skills better. So this said, uh, all these techniques of machine learning, AI, deep learning uh, are helping a lot here uh, because uh, when we are trying to look for entities on all that, uh, now we are processing it in a different way, so there is a confidence. I am, let's say, 70% sure that this location is somewhere in Marrakesh, uh, so if I am not completely confident, should I go back to the user and ask him to confirm? Uh, and all that now becomes possible using uh, these techniques uh, and probability distribution as well. So in the literature and also in the market, we find several approaches to how to offer skills uh, for a conversation agent. So one of them is procedural, uh, or as an example is a dialogue flow diagram. Uh, how is that approach is mostly the designer or the developer or the engineer uh, will define a different state uh, and it's going from one step to another in, in, in a certain way. To, at this position, I'm going to look for starting location. Uh, then once I get the starting location, I'm going to look for the destination. Once I have the destination, I'm going to ask for how much you want to pay for it. So the conversation is guided step by step in a certain way, in a predictable way. Uh, and in this approach, the node that I'm showing here is really is the state. So the developer has really to predict and define all possibilities. And there is no room for the system to correct itself. Uh, and the developer should overcome the problem, as an example, if the if, if, if the uh, one information is not uh, detected properly, what you should be doing, uh, that will be something that we put on the developer with, that is writing the skills uh, to, to handle that. A second approach, which is uh, event-driven approach or the declarative approach, uh, that is uh, it's been actually for more than 25 years. I do remember with Olivier uh, in 2000 or 1999 working on the communicator project uh, where these kind of approaches are uh, well defined at that stage as well, uh, where you have a state that is what information do I need? Uh, and you have a set of precondition and actions, and if you know that that information is filled, then you do something about it. So if you have, if a state is satisfied, uh, if a precondition is available, then execute a specific action. Now uh, this can be handled through also machine learning or deep learning. It doesn't have to be really if then else as a condition. Uh, and the machine learning model can detect that this condition is now likely available and execute something accordingly. And here, uh, the flow depends on the dialogue state, uh, the context, and the entity. Recently, uh, let's say around five years ago, uh, with all these deep learning work and RNNs and all that, we start to see a different kind of approach, how to author skills. 
and we call those example-based approaches. And here is really based on the sentence. You try to detect the intent. Once you have the intent, then you perform a specific action based on that. So here as an example, if you have find food outlets near here, you understand that because there is the word here, you detect the intent, the intent is location. And because you in detected the intent is a location, you are gonna say what type of food are you looking for? Because that, the information is missing now. You get the location, but you have something missing. Now, if you said fish and chips, you detect the food type information, and accordingly, you are gonna provide an action uh, for that as well. How that during a training, or when you are writing the skills, that is performed through giving examples, and the machine learning approaches will generalize. So even though maybe your example is only about Indian cuisine or Moroccan cuisine, uh, but the system will generalize enough based on the intent to know that this is the food type and will perform well even though if you tell him uh, fish and chips. To give you an example of what is happening in the market and what uh, companies are using uh, to write skills. Uh, so if we take the procedural approach, uh, Amazon Alexa as an example, uh, Voxio, uh, Plum Voice, all these are using procedural based approaches uh, to write their skills. Uh, for, again, I would like to come to the point that those are task completions skills. So I'm not talking about chit chat, cafe discussion. I am focusing on the skills that you would like to perform something, uh, you would like to execute something you are not doing uh, a discussion uh, with the, uh, it's not a chit chat. Uh, so in the case of event-driven approach, example of that is API.ai from Google. Uh, Microsoft is using that as well. Uh, we have the bot framework that is also tools that we uh, provide to developer to write skills. Nuance is using that and Apple as well is using that with the acquisition of a company called Vocalic. Uh, for the example-based approaches, I didn't really see something in production, but there is a lot of work happening. Example of that, Baidu, Facebook, all these are right now using this technology or provide this kind of technology for people to use to, to, to write skills. Now, what is the pros and cons of three, these uh, three approaches? So looking to the procedural one, the advantages are that many designers and developers are familiar with the procedural approach. Uh, developer usually feels confident that they are controlling what is happening. The disadvantage of that, it is uh, the dialogue can be frustrated for users. The user don't have really the luxury and the freedom to input uh, queries in a natural way. Um, and then the flow diagrams quickly becomes complex for complicated tasks. In the case of a declarative approach, uh, it is easy to author slot filling dialogues. It allows from, for flexible user directed dialogue, but also it has the advant disadvantages of being harder for the developer and, the, and, and to, to write skills. Uh, we find out that it is, uh, the developer usually they are not very comfortable when it gets to complicated skills using these approaches. Uh, and now for the example based approach, um, it has the advantage of uh, lowering the skill bar for developers so it's really easier, becomes easier. Everyone can provide examples and based on your examples, there it goes, you have, you have a system. The disadvantage so far, uh, to my knowledge, uh, we didn't see industry scale for task completion, as I mentioned earlier. So what I'm trying to get to is currently there is no clear agreement on which is the easiest authoring style uh, in the community and in the industry in general. Uh, however, we do believe that a machine learning driven approach in the runtime that can support these different approaches is really what is uh, interesting to have and what uh, 
uh, can be closer to user expectation. So why we care about this? So the idea here is when you are authoring, it depends on the amount of data you have. So there is two things. There is the human effort and there is the data you have. So if you don't have data, usually you start with the procedural approach. Where you have a lot of data, the example-based approach. In the case of human effort or uh, developer effort, uh, the procedure war needs maybe more developer effort uh, and the example-based require less engineering effort. And for the dialogue manager runtime, uh, the degree of freedom increases as you move toward uh, an example-based approach. So one thing to put in mind that uh, what we expect from a dialogue manager uh, is that we need to support many domains, tasks, and dialogue styles. Uh, so the current approach is uh, have two components, the federate and rank. Uh, and there is other one that is shared experience between dialogue managers. So you want to go from one skill to another. If I tell you. When is, uh, remind me five minutes before my meeting with Kamal. There is more than one skills here that you need to uh, interact together. There is a reminder, and there is also the calendar skills. You need to go to the calendar skills, understand that you have a meeting with Kamal. Then you need to decompute five minutes before that time. And then you need to go to the reminder skills and execute that. So one can argue that, yes, I can write the skills that do both. Yes, we can do that, but we are not going to scale. At one point, you cannot only do, do the entire thing. A better way is really to have a skill simple and to have uh, a smart runtime that is able to compose between the different uh, skills here. So an active area of research that is happening here, which is I just was referring to, is how if you, if you consider all these skills, uh, if you consider the space, your space as a graph. I'll, I'll get to this slide to explain it better. So we consider the entire space as a graph, where every node here represents a skill. And every node can be either a skill or an entity. And the whole problem becomes how to search this graph and going from one node to another. And then the whole problem of dialogue manager becomes a little bit different, become closer to a problem of a search engine. And that's where we believe the industry is going to. So the advantage of this are that you're, you have a basic skills that are simple. And then using the graph knowledge, you make them complicated by addressing issues that uh, to solve, you need many skills to interact together. Going back to the example, remind me five minutes before my meeting with Kamal, something else is I would like a pizza with, as a topping, uh, the uh, vegetable of the day. Uh, all these cannot be solved by simple skills. You need many skills to interact together. Giving here an example where, uh, the query is, get me a ride to SeaTac Airport at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, even though sometimes you think this is simple, it is complicated because you need to understand that tomorrow refers to a specific date and resolve that. Uh, tomorrow is, you know, 7, uh, December 7th, so there is a time expression there to be done. You need also to understand that get me a ride is about uh, booking a taxi. And now I am booking a taxi, yes, but there is many skills that can book a taxi. Uh, we are referring to, uh, at least in the US, you have Lyft, you have Yellow Cab, you have Uber, and you have many others that you will, all of them, trigger. And that's where, wh what I show here, that all the skills are triggered. But it happens that the user you always use Lyft, and he has a preference to Lyft. So then I need to re-rank the whole thing again and push left in the top and then execute. So that's why going back to the idea of I have this whole, whole knowledge graph of basic skills 
that I rank them here, and then I use personalized information to detect what is my preference, rank again, so I make it, I'm making it a search problem, and then execute. So we kind of change the, the dialogue system mechanism the way it was before, that once you get into a skill, once you get into a skill, you stay there until you f finish the execution of that skills to a space where you have this huge representation that everything is a state, and from that state you can go to any other state without being really stuck in that specific skills where you are. I'll skip this since this is uh, the introduction. I mean, this is what you expect from a dialogue system. Uh, this is uh, uh, what the dialogue can do. I'll skip this as well. Uh, let me maybe spend some time here in terms of technology where we are right now. Uh, so I've, I think all of us agree that machine learning for state tracking uh, is, uh, has a lot of potential and gives good results. Uh, but we also uh, use more and more reinforcement learning. We need to, the system to correct itself based on optimization function. Uh, we start using deep learning uh, a couple of years ago, mostly to reduce the feature engineering. And uh, mostly when you, ha you are in the dialogue state, you need to uh, handle that and you need less feature. Deep learning was very useful there. Uh, we using imitation learning for a rapid prototype based on example dialogue. Uh, you know, these example-based skills, how to write a dialogue with, with, with examples. Uh, and also the use of uh, a different kind of uh, deep learning approaches, referring to DQN as an example that increase the adaptability and large amount of data becomes available. And then of course, end-to-end -end natural language training network uh, that exploit and label data, and this is mostly efficient for uh, chit-chat kind of skills. In the remaining 15 to 20 minutes, I would like to take you to a different space. Uh, this is, in, in the NLP or dialogue community, this is the kind of talk that you, you hear about them, maybe it's familiar for you, mostly for people working on NLP, uh, but I would like to take you to a space that this is a great, how to measure its quality. And how to measure its quality, I'm not really interested on precision or F measure or recall and all that. I don't, I don't, I don't want these. I would like to focus on the user. So if we look to digital assistant, how a digital assistant different from a search engine as an example? In a search engine, so there is these three areas that I will address quickly. A click less interaction attention, voice interaction, and the conversation. This is what you have in, in a digital assistant or in a speaker. This comes often. Uh, and compare it, if, if, if we look a little bit what is happening in the search community for people working on information retrieval, uh, why, I do believe one reason that the search is mature now and uh, the performance of search engine is good is mostly there is, a, there is a clear way to measure the quality of a search engine uh, from user perspective. Uh, I'd like to focus on this point. Uh, as an example, uh, it is well established right now that long dwell time, click, what is a long dwell time? That means you click on a document and you stay there for some time. That's a, that some time is mostly estimated around 30 seconds. That is a sign that that document is good for you that you are happy with that document. Now, is the document of a good quality or not? I'm not interested. What I am interested in, the user is happy with that document. So that is a good sign for me. And this is a well-established measure in, in the search community. Uh, there is the uh, task pane uh, require click. When you are exploring, you are clicking everywhere and you are going back and forth. Uh, the, the, uh, the carousel query click, the task pane shover and click, all these, how people interact with the search engine. And, and here, actually, these are becoming well-established measure, and when the search engine provides the results, based on user behavior, how they are behaving, they can tell you if the user is happy or not with a certain degree. We don't really have that with the dialogue system. We don't have, really have that. Uh, when we talk about conversation. And I will give you an example. So we are talking about intelligence. Here, if I have a query uh, about the weather, uh, so if you ask about the weather and you get these results, 
usually you don't click on it because you are satisfied. So we call this abandoned query in search. So here, even though the user didn't click, it looks to me good as a result. Here, even though he didn't click as well, but the results are probably bad. And how to do that? So I know that the user didn't click, but I don't know if he's happy or not. That get me to two points that I will try to address in, in the remaining 10 minutes, uh, which is how we measure the quality using voice interaction and attention. So for voice interaction, I'm going to start with, uh, with an example. So this is real user data collected at 3.14 p.m. Uh, and I will share with you what the user is said and tell me. Different kind of graph. Can you tell me what the user said? Different kind of graph. Different kind of graph. So, so this is what the system recognized. This is what speech recognition system said. Different kind of girl. Who agrees with this uh, output? OK, so let's keep going. Six seconds later, the same user. Different kind of graph. This is what the system recognizes the second time. Different kind of grass. Another thing, did you notice that there is a change in the tone? OK. Keep that in mind a little bit. It's important. So eight seconds later. Different kind of graph. What about the tone? Higher, right? And again, we recognize again different kinds of grass. That's what the system said. All right. So what the user did in this case? 12 seconds later, he gets upset. He typed the query. This is what he typed. Different kind of graphs. So this is the graph. Uh, as in here. What I am trying to get to, for my speech recognition system, if I look to the first query, uh, so maybe here I don't have a graph, but in the end best example here, my different kind of graph since was number two. Remember that here, in here, I recognize a different kind of grass, and I here recognize a different kind of grass. So if my system is intelligent, I should not produce the same output again. At least from my end best, I can correct myself uh, using online signal. It is, it is different from training. In a training, you collect the data. It is offline. You label it. You train your model. Here, I'm looking to a completely different approach. You cannot update your model in the fly, but you can update your answer in the fly. And this is an approach where, even though it's the same recognizer, it's the same model, I can play with the output to suggest something different. Because I have the end best, I have the trailers. So, what I am trying to get to is there is many signals that the user provide to us to correct ourselves, to correct the system. So Repetition. If the, system, if the user is repeating himself somehow, that's a strong signal. Do something about it. Don't repeat the same thing. Don't ask him again for the same thing. There is the partial emphasis. Uh, and partial emphasis, the way how you repeat the query from the acoustic, you are slower. You will try to emphasize on a specific word. You are trying to spend more time on a word. Uh, acoustics, louder. You are unhappy. Or also, you just switch 
the input mode switch. You go to a keyboard. That's a good signal. It's not, it, you are not happy with that. So let me give you an example of repetition. So repetition is really the strongest signals that we have. When the user is repeating himself, uh, by definition, so here like U2 and YouTube, they are really similar from acoustic perspective uh, and even from language modeling perspective. And sometimes uh, it is important to pay attention to that. So how we do that, we look to the metaphone representation. Uh, and here an example of WhatsApp. Uh, that they are written similarly when we do the metaphone representation versus the text representation. Uh, so we use that uh, to help us correct ourselves. Uh, what we also do is we look to the emphasis, and I explained what I mean by emphasis. And so these are the signals usually we try to address, uh, how the loudness, the pitch, and, and, and this change between the two, that helps. Uh, and also I mentioned the uh, change of input text. All these features, retraining the model on the end best, uh, helped us improve our word error rate as well as the web score. Uh, this is a relative improvement. And here I'm giving an example of the, how that is a change. So this is a query of pictures of whale. And, and this is whale as, as a fish. The picture of whale, acoustically, it's the same thing, but it's completely different. So from user satisfaction, it's not the same experience. In here, we are talking about the fish. In here, we are talking about place. So something else, I talked about voice, since uh, Olivier tells me that I have only five minutes left. So I'll try to finish this in five minutes. Uh, so, in addition to voice interaction, we are using also other signals. Uh, here, the clickless interaction, how I interact with the digital assistant without the click. So, the click is a good signal, we use it as well. Uh, but if I have a speaker, I cannot click. Uh, usually, if I am driving the car, I don't click. So, I am, how I am handling those things. So, the speech is one, the voice interaction is one. And the attention modeling this is what I show here. Again, I go to the example where I have a query. I get two different results. Here I said 10 feet in meter. I have the results. I have no need to click. I have my results. I should be happy here. The same thing. I asked, I asked for restaurants nearby. I got all the restaurants. There is no need to click as well. So how we handle how the user is happy or not. So there is a studies on eyes tracking show that there is really a high correlation between gaze time and user satisfaction. The more time you spend on, on something, you don't move it, that means it's getting your attention. You are looking at it. So th there is tools that detect that, but actually, you know, you, can, you, cannot, you cannot give this to every user and force the user really to have these kind of tools to understand if he's looking to that as well. So, we need to look to a different mechanism to, 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 to detect that or to measure that. So the different mechanism is looking to the viewport. And, and I will explain a little bit how is the, the, the viewport. So now looking to the viewport, this is in the, case of a uh, in the case of a cell phone as an example, you have this. So you issue a query, the user have a results. And what you are trying to do here is the user is doing something with the results. And let's see, this is animated. So look to what the user is doing. He's going down a little bit. He's clicking here. He's going down more. He's, he's doing many things, All right? So I have this information, how the user is interacting with my system, going up and down. And the idea how I can leverage this to understand if the user is happy or not. How I understand that the experience I'm providing to the user is bringing value to him or not. So we look to a couple of features that helps us detect that. We look to the reading time. We look to the time to focus. We look to the total time spent. 
and we look to the fraction of the page examinated. All these features together help us to define the user satisfaction. Since I don't have time, I will really focus on one example how we compute feature, how I compute the reading time. <coughs> this is my results. And I know that this, this is the only portion of the text that is, uh, the user can see from all the page. So the user now, he, he spent three seconds here. Then he crawled down and he's spending, he, sp he has a six seconds here. And then he crawled a little bit down and he spends two seconds here. However, I know for that article that I showed him, he was looking to only a portion of it, not the entire thing. Here he's looking to more, and he's looking to really the bottom. And I need to leverage this to compute something. So that's the viewport height. And here, and here I'm saying that, okay, he spent 33% of the viewport, he spent three seconds on it, 66% here, 20% there. So I know that that three seconds becomes one second's cost, this is a four seconds cost, and this is zero four seconds cost. And then now I know that roughly speaking on that he spent 5.4 seconds. Also I look to the pixel. What I'm showing him, I know it has a high of 400 pixel and a width of 300 pixel. So doing the math, if I take the attribute review time divided by the pixel area, I get my metrics. And this can be a good measure to measure user satisfaction. This is a model that I trained it with a different kind of features. And at least let's focus only on the DSAT. The DSAT, I get to 70% DSAT measure, F measure, by using these kind of features. So, okay. Uh, what I try to answer here, that answer images are a snippet, they have information that provide if the document is abandoned or not, if it's a good abandonment or not. That means if the user is happy even though I didn't click. Also, the user, yes, is providing a signal to us, telling us if he is happy or not. And we should leverage that to propose other solution and to not be stuck on that state, even in a dialogue state. If the user give, me, give, you, give, give you an answer and he's repeating himself, don't do the same thing. Go to a different state because you know that the user is unhappy. If the user is happy, keep staying in that state or go to the predicted state that where you should be. Uh, so the time spent with the answer, uh, the swipe action if you go, so usually with your phone, if you swipe quickly, you are unhappy. If you swipe a little bit, usually you are paying attention. All these are features that can be leveraged. So quality measurement in brief. Measuring user satisfaction online is key for effective digital assistance systems. User satisfaction can be modeled using the clicks, a tracking, user gesture, uh, viewport time, uh, partial emphasis, repetition, uh, the input method switch. Uh, the answers, image, and the snippets are the source of good abandonment, uh, and we can use all that to improve the accuracy. As a summary, so I went through a couple of things. What I'd like to iterate is intelligence or skills uh, will not be a niche addition to how people use the technology. We do believe that it will become the prime mediator. We also believe that intelligence is going to become a utility. Uh, users will drive big de delta improvement in core assistance endpoints. Uh, there is several approaches existing to author intelligence skills. Uh, I mentioned three of them. And measuring user satisfaction is again, is key for effective skills uh, accuracy. And thank you. I enjoy this idea of uh, evaluating 
um, as what we did in subjective evaluation with the measures, as you said before, rouge, bleu, maybe one day vert and things like that. Um, but in your evaluation, you don't take into account maybe the disability of some people. Someone who is normal without any problem, he can, you can take into account all the details you give, but someone who, with disability, maybe he will take more time in order to, to focus on something, and he is, he is happy with the, with the result. So do you think taking into account this kind of problems or not at Microsoft? Uh, I, I do agree with you. Uh, there is users that uh, have uh, different kind of behaviors, uh, even here. So uh, the approach we use in A-B testing in general, uh, that the first, th so everything is a delta. The measurement is a delta. It's not an absolute measure. It is about how better I am where I am. So the way we do this, you cannot do this at the person level, at, at the individual level. You need to do it at the population. So the more the population, the better. <laughs> So the way you start is what we call the seed finder. You start, you have the same system, and you look to a large population of people, and you try to, sp uh, to split that population in two where they have the same behavior with one system. And then since now you have two populations with the same behavior, you take one population and you switch another system on it. So that means the delta, you can, that in that case, you can measure the data. Exactly. So, so when you do that, I agree with you, if for a specific individual, all this metric doesn't make sense. But if you look to the population in general, and because you have uh, the seed finder that they are telling you that they have initially the same behavior, that now they have a different behavior, now you know that you are bringing a value. In the de looking to the delta. That's the, uh, thank you, yes, you actually you have a point. That's the direction where the community is going, where people are working on, and there is that belief. The more data, the more we get that. Uh, people are looking to how we build the knowledge graph automatically, thank you. Yes, and, you actually, and, you and people that are direction. talking that those, all these are, the web is a, is a set of APIs, how I can make uh, a digital assistant or a skill that automatically walk from one web search to another one in, in an automatic way. Yes, uh, people are working in this direction. Are we there yet? No, uh, but that's where people are investing right now. Yes, we, that's, that's the model we did, so we detect that. Uh, so we detect that from the speech. We look to uh, mostly, so, yes, so there is uh, the looking to the emphasis detection versus, so emotion means many things. Uh, for, for satisfaction, dissatisfaction purpose, we find that the emphasis is a better signal. Uh, and what I mean by emphasis, the user tried to express himself in a slowness way, try to interact. It, it has a value, we, we, we see a value there. Now the user becoming angry, 
and looking to the uh, pitch and all that didn't help much. We, we know that he's unhappy. We don't know what can we do about it. Maybe he's just unhappy, uh, by definition. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's a harder signal. Uh, now, what I, we find as well, and we, we, we worked on that, and I didn't present it here, that people, when they talk to digital assistant, they really use bad words. And they use also thank you, uh, those kind of things. So somehow, at least in the US, really people are interacting with, almost interacting with the operator. So we have those signals. We get, thank you, Cortana. We get, I hate you, Cortana, and, yeah. and the other words as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I mentioned yesterday, say, the, the young boy saying to, the, to Siri, Siri, will you, will you marry me? <laughs> another aspect. Uh, but uh, 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 when another aspect is, in, uh, we, we talked about yesterday, uh, most users, some users, I, I guess, uh, think that the system understand them yes. and they are not uh, aware of the fact that they don't, he doesn't un he doesn't understand anything <laughs> yes question you can chat with him later on so let let's thank the speaker again <laughs> thank you okay thank you Olivier, thank you, Ahmed, for this interesting talk. So I think that we have the next session now. Uh, yes. So we have a session. Um, what is it? Yes, so we will have uh, a session about dialogue and information retrieval, and it will be chaired by Professor Franck Poirier. Please. Welcome to the last session. The name. Uh, the session is about uh, dialogue and information retrieval. And the first speaker. Where is the first speaker? Man or Rim Fez or Kamel Smiley, you are. Come on. Uh, 